Hi, today on City of Churches, we're in Jamaica Estates, Queens, to visit the Immaculate Conception Monastery. Hi, I'm Anthony Mangano, and welcome to a new episode of City of Churches. Today, today we're going to be visiting the Immaculate Conception Monastery Parish and Retreat House, right here in Jamaica Estates, Queens. Now, did you know that this hilltop was the highest point in Long Island, and it was developed during the Ice Age? Can you imagine how cold it was back then? I mean, we talk about how cold it is now. I couldn't even bear it. Thank God summer's coming. Now, in 1655, an outpost was established nearby, which the early settlers called Rustall a Dutch word that means quiet village. And when the English conquered the Dutch colony in 1664, the name of the town was changed to Jamaica, a Native American term which means land of the beaver. Now this area was undeveloped until the early 20th century and mostly was forest. Now the 500 acres of Jamaica Estates was developed in 1907 atop a steep tree covered hillside. A small village of Tudor style houses as well as Cape Cod and Craftsman style residences were constructed amid a forest of trees, many of which remained as part of the local neighborhood landscape and which remains here today. And when the Queensboro Bridge was opened in 1909, it made Queens County more accessible and many, many upscale New Yorkers moved out here to Jamaica Estates. Now this is the original gatehouse that welcomed the people to this community in 1908. Now there used to be a beautiful stone lodge that was connected to it, but that was demolished a long time ago. And inside this gatehouse is a memorial plaque honoring the people that fought and died during World War II. Now this neighborhood had several well-known residents over the years, such as German athlete Margaret Bergman Lambert. Perhaps one of the best female high jumpers in the world back in 1936. She was barred from competing in 1936 Berlin Olympics because of a Jewish fate. So she immigrated to the United States and became a champion in the high jump and shot put for the USA. In 2015, she celebrated her 101st birthday at her home right here in Jamaica Estates. Classical music composer Bushloff Martineau began his symphonic career when he immigrated to the United States in 1941, fleeing the German invasion of France and found refuge right here in Jamaica Estates. Now he composed his symphony number no. one as he walked through the neighborhood, and it has been performed by all the major U.S. orchestras. And don't forget, of course, Mr. Donald Trump, the Trump family. Donald grew up right here in this quiet neighborhood, in this house, long before he fired anyone. Now the story of this neighborhood would not be complete without a visit to the Immaculate Conception Monastery, which we're going to visit next, right here on City of Churches. So come on. Well, welcome back. Well, we're here at the Immaculate Conception Monastery right here in Jamaica, Queens, and I'm with Father William Murphy. Father, thank you for inviting us to your church. You're most welcome. This is an amazing place. I, I pulled up. I mean, thank God I didn't park in the bishop's spot. <laughs> we were watching. Okay, thank you. That was very nice of you. It's, the grounds are so beautiful here, and uh, we're going to show our viewers that. But can you tell us a little history, uh, tell the viewers some history about the Immaculate Conception here? Yes, uh, Bishop Thomas Malloy invited us here, I believe in 1924, 1922, um, and he invited the Passionists to come to begin a retreat house, um, also a parish for this new area that was going to be Jamaica Estates that was developing, and then also to have a monastery here. Um, the Passionists were mainly preaching an order for preachers, but retreat houses were becoming popular now. So they were the three areas that were concentrated here. 
Uh, also, there would be a school that would accompany the parish and then a convent. Uh, so all of that began about 1924. Would that be when it was built? Uh, yes. Well, what happened, the, uh, the Passionists bought 16 acres that was the Michael Deegan estate. Uh, Mr. Deegan was involved in the construction of the subways. So we bought the 16 acres and there was a mansion that came with it. So that mansion served as really the first retreat house, the residence for the community. And then the first mass was offered there on July the 5th in 1924. By the end of 1924, there was a small 300 seating chapel that was built, a little church. Uh, and then also in 1924, uh, before the year was over, there was a retreat and there were nine men who made a retreat using the Deegan estate. So that was really the first facility here. Father, what are some of the unique things here at the monastery? Well, one, one thing that is very unique is that uh, it's on the 16 acres, and we're really in the middle of this part of Long Island. Um, you wouldn't think that the subway is one block away. Um, the estate, the Deegan estate, was on land that hadn't been developed until really 1900 and it's sort of the backbone of Long Island. I've been told that this is the highest elevation in Long Island, although several feet of it were removed when the land was developed by the Deacons. So there are 16 acres in the middle of a lot of hustle and bustle, but it's very quiet. When the trees are out in the summer, we have a large garden and you wouldn't know that you're in the middle of so much activity. So it's a, a sort of an oasis, very beautiful. Uh, there's a monastery, the retreat house, and the church, all of which are large, the school. Um, there's a, a cemetery, we have a cemetery here for the Passionists, and some monuments there to the Chinese missionaries, the Filipino and the uh, West Indian missionaries over the past 50 years, that's all in the cemetery. Um, so they would be, I think, the biggest things. Yeah. So what would you say the difference is between the churches and the monastery that's here? Yes. Now, our monastery would be more the residence. In, in times past, the missionaries who went out from here to do work around New York or beyond, they would have lived there. It uh, was for a good while also our seminary, maybe 15 years. Uh, the seminarians would be here, take some classes for a while at St. John's which is only a few blocks away. Now our numbers are smaller and in the monastery we have, it would be our assisted care living for many of our elderly men. Uh, so the monastery would be mainly the residence. Uh, the parish would be as a parish in the diocese, so a very active parish, large parish. Uh, and then the retreat house would uh, invite people to come various programs on weekends and through the week. Um, so let's see, that's the whole, that's all three of the entities. Yeah. Has the community changed over the years? Yes, um, in the parish community, mm -hmm. uh, very much. Uh, I was a seminarian here in 1967. Oh, wow. Uh, returning now uh, to be here working in the parish. Uh, the parish is very ethnic. Uh, there's always the turnover of demographics, people moving, people getting older. Uh, fortunately, our parish continues to be replaced by new families coming in. Um, many different countries are represented, but it keeps our parish as a fairly young parish. The, when you look out saying Mass at the, the congregation, there are a lot of young people, young families. See, that's great. That means that it's, it's turning over, like you said, which is nice. And it, as long as the, the people are coming, the families, it just, it's, you know, it's a good thing that I, I see it, to keep. Life-giving. Life-giving. It's amazing how different groups come in. Yes. And uh, over the years, has there been any, been any renovation since this church was, a monastery was built? Yes, from? yes, that's a good question. Um, originally, the, after the mass began in the Deegan estate, uh, by the end of that year, there was a small 300 seating uh, church. In two years, the lower church was built and that, that seated 1,200 people. So they, they worked very hard there. Uh, the church was underground it is now it now serves as the the basement of the new church which was built in 1962 dedicated in 62 um, but the original church uh, you had to go down a flight of stairs um, and 
from the pictures, you hear that often people thought it was the subway. And really? People, yes, it has two entrances off the main street, and they had uh, sort of uh, doors, double doors that would go down. It looks a little bit like a subway entrance, really. So that was in, in use then up until 1958, the new church was begun. And on top of the original church is now the large new church. The sanctuary of the old church has been kept and we use it for daily mass. It's like a chapel, uh, very much untouched. Uh, a lot of what was there in the original church continues. Um, so the new church was built then and opened in 62. Um, the retreat house was built, I believe in 1954 it opened. Um, and then the monastery, when it was built, that was in the 1930s. Um, that has continued to be as it is. The school was added to, that was opened in 1937. The Sisters of St. Joseph staffed it and continue to work there. Uh, and then the, the school was added to 1950, convent, large convent is there. So all of that has developed over the years. And is the school, obviously the school is active. The school is active, yes. I, before I came to work here in Jamaica, I was working in Baltimore three years ago, and as I left, we sold our school. When I arrived here, I was told that we're building three new classrooms for See, our school. See, that's great. Yeah. That, that's really great to hear that because, like my first uh, school, my first church was St. John the Evangelist, and the school closed. And they were like, I, here I am coming out of the church, and we did our special, and across the street, it's condos. It just, you know, I remember going to school in my uniform, and there were great times. It kind of, it's kind of sad. They give us profound memories. So this is a great thing that this is, you know, this is active. Yeah, very. You know, Father, um, obviously we're, we're taping in the in this room. Could you explain to our viewers about where we are yes. and the significance of this room? Yes, this was the original monastery chapel, and you can see they have the choir uh, seats facing one another. There was another bank of the choir stalls facing one another when there was a larger number of priests and brothers in the monastery. Um, so the chapel has been renovated not too long ago, um, and it's now used mainly for the retreat house. So this would be where the retreatants come for their prayer. Um, the cross above us is new. sort of that barrel vaulting type of ceiling. And I think Art Deco is the way they describe it. So the stations of the cross would be that style. Okay. And then behind us, the mosaic of the Immaculate Conception for the... Oh, wow. Yes. yes. Uh, That's beautiful. Yeah. And now the altar here, that, was, that would have been changed with the Vatican Council. So, but I imagine they used the marble that was here and adjusted that. I see the inlay. It looks very similar to the lower church where the marble altar rail and statues are there, but a lot of inlaid tile, I guess that is. Well, it's actually beautiful. It's a cozy little chapel. It's very nice. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, no, it, it really is. Now, my favorite thing that I talk about on, on, um, on every episode is I'm a stained glass guy. Oh. Okay. And you have some really beautiful stained glass here. I mean... I always say to my viewers that I believe that, you know, sometimes uh, the stained glass is like a book and the story, the, God, the Bible come to life in like a, like a version of it. You're looking at it, you could, you could actually see everything going on and there's so much detail. Is there, do you have a favorite one? Well, you know what comes to my mind is the contrast. Uh, because this was the monastery chapel, I'm seeing all these windows are, are depictions of the passion. Mm -hmm. So that would be appropriate, the passionists. Uh, but in contrast to the church, it's a different style of window. They're modern, uh, and they would be more dedicated to Mary for the parish of the Immaculate Conception. Mm -hmm. So you, you'll see there the rosary, uh, the events of Mary, and then also the sacraments. But uh, if you, when you show the, 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 the windows, you'll, you'll notice a totally different type of window. Well, we, we, the fascinating thing about it is, and I never knew this and I learned this on the show, is that when they were designed, and these churches were built in the 1920s and earlier, really some of them had no electricity yet. Or, or they did, but the, it was built in such a way that when the sun would be up, it would illuminate into the room. 
and we brighten the room up and, and, and we just illuminate. And then the pictures and everything would just come to life. Yes. It, it, it's truly amazing because the detail of it that goes into that work, as well as the statues. Yes. Don't get me wrong, but I, I'm, a, I'm a stained glass guy. Yes, very good. Well, maybe it can convert you. There's a very beautiful crucifix downstairs, very old, that I know they want you to see, so. Oh, absolutely, that's, that's probably something very special we'll have to show our viewers later. Father, are there any original artifacts still here at the monastery that date back to when it was built? Yes, mainly in the lower church. Um, this monastery wouldn't be a real old monastery. Uh, and it's interesting, you see how monasteries become, they collect, they seem to collect art and very beautiful religious things. Um, but in the scale of time, this would be a fairly modern building. But in the lower church, there are some very beautiful marble statues of Paul of the Cross and Saint Gabriel. Also, uh, it was not the early part or the front part of that church um, which, upon which the new church was built was not remodeled. Uh, so it re was really kept as it was. So the altar rail is still there. Uh, and you see some uh, very beautiful inlaid marble in that area. Uh, so I think that's very, very unique, and very beautiful. Are there any original statues that relate to, this, to the church? Uh, the, the two oldest ones would be the marble ones. They're rather plain, um, but they, they would be uh, go back to the beginning. Um, there's also a, sort of a visiting statue of our Blessed Mother that, that should be mentioned, and that came from another parish, I believe in South Jamaica. Uh, the statue was brought from Italy, and uh, it was used at the time of plague. A city, a little town was suffering, and the statue was walked around the town and uh, the devotion of the people says that that was the end. No one else died from that disease. Wow. So the statue's been saved. It found its way to the United States and now it's kept here in the lower church. Uh, there's usually a monthly mass. Uh, an Italian community gathers uh, for that devotion. See, that's, that's something interesting for our viewers. Is that it, yes. It's a statue, wow. That, uh, Maybe they should be able to take it out and maybe it could work again. It, it's on a base and it rolls. And I was told that a Padre, a Padre Pio blessed the base. Oh, see, that's, that's really nice. Now, when we get back, we're gonna show you something very unique right here at the Immaculate Conception Monastery. So don't go away, okay? We'll be right back. All right. This is a great place, Bob. <laughs> really great. is. Well, here we are, we're back with Father Murphy at the Immaculate Conception Monastery, and he's about to show us something that I think is truly amazing, and one amazing artifact. Father Murphy? Yes, this is an image of Christ crucified, and it's from 1610. 1610? Yes, it was made in Germany. Uh, and the artist, we know the artist's name was Christopher Rote. Um, so he did this out of Lindenwood. Wow. Um, and it was given to the Passionists. The reason that it is here in this monastery, following World War II, there was the Catholic Relief Services were working in Germany. And one of our priests was working in Bavaria. And as gratitude for the work that was done to help the people at that time, the hierarchy of Bavaria presented the, the cross or to the, the crucifix. Uh, so. Uh, that was taken eventually back to our seminary in Buffalo, New York, that was closed in the 1960s, torn down, and then was brought to Jamaica, to the monastery here. 
So it's made of linden wood. I find it interesting that the nails don't go through the hands, but they go through the wrist. I usually think of that as a more modern way of showing the crucifix. This is truly an amazing artifact here. Yes, yes. To create something so lifelike and has stand the course of time here. I mean, it is truly amazing that it's here at the church, which I recommend that uh, any of our followers on, on the show would love to come and see this. What train goes here? F line. The F line, you can come West out train. here and, and, and take a look at this as well as the grounds because it's absolutely beautiful. And this is truly, it's lifelike. I mean, if you look at Christ's face, this is a yes. truly a work of art. I mean, that's right. It's right at the chapel by the front door. Everyone yeah. is welcome. I mean, yes. wow. Father, thank you for sharing that with oh, us. You're most welcome. For sharing with you guys. Now I'm here with Father Murphy and some very young special guests. Father, can you introduce them to our audience? Yes, indeed. These are members of the Aquinas Honor Society at Immaculate Conception Catholic Academy. They have a lot of different, these are commendations and awards for various activities that they've done. Uh, they've written three books, and so I have one of them here. Him? That's Jamaica State. They've done all the, uh, all the research behind what we've talked about today. You guys did all this research? So everything Father Murphy and I were talking about, you guys have all the knowledge about, about the monastery and stuff. Wow, that, that to me is amazing, guys. I mean, really, you should really be proud of yourselves. Now, I'm gonna ask your names as we go along here. What's your name? I'm Jonathan. Hiya, Jonathan. I'm Jeremy. Hiya, Jeremy. I'm Diego. Hi, Diego. I'm Yanisha. Hi, Yanisha. I'm Milagros. Hi, Milagros. I'm Natalie. Hi, Natalie. I'm Axel. Hi, Axel. I'm Guillaume. Hi, Guillaume. I'm looking at all these certificates and proclamations you've got, and, and I just think it's, it's truly, truly amazing what you've done and what you've accomplished at such a young age. You should be very proud of yourselves, guys. Now, in this right here, this is an original piece of the World Trade Center that was given to them. And this is a stained glass that they created. This stained glass window of peace and hope was designed by the students of the Aquinas Honor Society in memory of the victims of the September 11th attacks. The flames to the left represent evil, while the dove of peace represents hope. The leaves of the olive branch are made of steel salvaged from the Twin Towers. The window was dedicated and installed at the Parish School in 2008. I truly think this is an amazing thing because it was a, uh, it was a horrible moment in our lives and uh, you guys did an honorable thing. I lost, I know we all did, friends and family. So I think that's a, a great thing that you guys achieved. I truly do. God bless you for doing that. You should be very proud of yourselves, guys. Well, I want to thank Father Murphy and the Aquinas Honor Society. So if you guys have any questions about this episode or any other future episodes that we did or you'd like to recommend the church to us, please follow us on Facebook or Twitter or on our website at www.netnewyork.tv or you can write into us at City of Churches at 1712 10th Avenue, Brooklyn, New York, 11215. Until next time, I'm Anthony Mangano with Father Murphy, these great kids at the Aquinas Honor Society. God bless you, and we'll see you soon. Thanks for watching.